This presentation is about a, a conceptual framework, uh, a conceptual framework which is indicating a, a change or a shift in heritage notions, which was discussed this morning already, and it relates this shift with an, what we observe as an ongoing integration into spatial planning policies. This is the case in the Netherlands, but perhaps we can uh, talk later on about whether it applies to your country as well. So I say we because I was working on this together with three professors, a multidisciplinary team of uh, urban uh, designer, a landscape architect, uh, economist, economist, I'm sorry, uh, a historic geographer, I and mean myself, I'm an urban planner. Uh, I work for the Cultural Heritage Agency of the Netherlands, which is part of the Ministry of Culture, and we are involved in the listing of national monuments, but also uh, providing advice in case of transformations to heritage, uh, subsidies, and also knowledge development. So, let's see. So, what, what I would like to start with is um, as an observation that our heritage stock has been growing. And this is not only to do about uh, an enlarging in terms of including intangible aspects, but at least in the case of the Netherlands, it also has to do with an increase in scale. So we do not only focus on monuments and objects, but also on entire cultural landscapes. And those are, are inherently dynamic. So and not be preserved only. Um, what we also see is that there's more interest into characteristic heritage, which may be more ordinary, not just the unique uh, top of the bill uh, type of heritage. And well, the third bullet, it says, it's, we've seen a shift from isolation, which means isolating heritage from spatial dynamics into one that we try to form, actually, to shape the heritage into our current needs and in order to also to transmit it to our future needs. So on pictures you see uh, some examples of industrial heritage, Fanella factory on the bottom uh, World Heritage site recently. So this shift in heritage notions, I've summarized it here, uh, referring to three sources, uh, but there are many others, I suppose. Um, Basically, it is about um, what's been called preservation, which is conser you know, conserving, protecting actually the heritage in order to, to keep it as we found it. And this leads to all kinds of debate because if you found, have found it in a certain condition, should you then interfere with degradation processes or not? Uh, this is the type of, of questions that uh, feature in this, uh, in this approach. And then we move to uh, what Gregory Edward has called uh, conservation, uh, which has a much more instrumental take on heritage as it's um, applied for other policy purposes, such as regeneration or social inclusion in some cases. And thirdly, we have moved to a situation uh, where what Edward calls heritage, but others have called it constructive conservation. Um, a situation in which heritage is actually an infinite supply, an infinite stock, and entails both physical aspect but also the immaterial ones. Uh, it's, it's about what the expert thinks, but it's also about what people think and what they come up with. So then I now move to the case of the Netherlands. Um, in the Netherlands, we have seen a couple of moments that were milestones in um, how we approach uh, our heritage um, supply. Uh, first of all, industrialization, which led to um, certain individuals to be to to be anxious about how our how rapid our environment was changing and uh, how we can preserve. Um, the elements, and that's the, the phase in which it's mostly the society actually that's taking up the, the heritage concern. And right after the Second World War, uh, there's a major um, urge to build, and um, we see an institutionalization also of, of heritage care. It's now done mostly by the central government. Um, then we have the, the phase in the 70s when there's a a lot of heritage is derelict and abandoned, um, and there are huge programs for uh, urban renewal, and um, this, this leads to a uh, major upgrade of, of inner city centers, 
uh, historical centers of cities and um, that then feeds into uh, what was in the 90s, uh, inter, inter urban competition. So then the market is actually taking over. We made this, this model, which is obviously a, a model and not in reality, is always more complex. So, in formal terms, uh, heritage care in the Netherlands has been uh, formalized, institutionalized in, uh, in the Monument Act in uh, 61. And this act already included the instrument of the protective townscapes, which is basically a conservation area, which allows for much more dynamic um, and uh, implementation of, 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 the, of the list monuments, uh, that is, there, what's allowed to be changed to these, uh, these, these monuments that was arranged already uh, through the zoning, through spatial planning uh, policies. Um, so then, uh, at the turn of the, of the millennium, there was a national policy memorandum, the Belvedere um, memorandum, which has the main motto of preservation through development. Uh, and this also, of course, links to what has been discussed this morning, how to balance uh, preservation with development. Well, this one is actually saying you can only preserve if you use, if you find a, a functional basis and thereby uh, the funds to, to basically maintain a property. So, and recently now all local and uh, regional uh, governments are obliged when they make new spatial plans or visions to take into account cultural heritage values. So, these are not only listed monuments or uh, protected landscapes, but these are values in general. So, yes, these can of course be intangible also. This is quite a challenge for those governments. So now comes the model, uh, conceptual frame we, uh, we, we drew. So what you see is basically that um, at first, in the preservation uh, uh, approach, heritage was isolated from spatial uh, developments, and that's why we call it heritage as a, as a sector, as a separate entity next to the spatial domain. Uh, and then afterwards, heritage is getting much more integrated into these spatial dynamics. Uh, we call it heritage as a factor. Um, thirdly, this is now recently going on, heritage is rather a factor, uh, which is a, basically an arrow, uh, something that inspires spatial development. And in general, then you see from the top to the bottom uh, a change in attitude in culture, from a, change, a culture of loss to one of, of, of profit. And I've included this slide just to show you that this model we have been uh, developing this in the frame of a research agenda we've been uh, developing, and um, you can find it on the internet. So let's get a bit deeper into the heritage as a spatial sector. What's been, um, it's basically heritage. The selection of it is, is decided by by experts who do so in an objective way uh, based on uh, criteria such as. Uh, authenticity and um, uniqueness. Um, and as I said before, discussions are then about material integrity and how to how to maintain that. Um, heritage is also limited. We have a, 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 an en ending stock um, and we need to make sure that it's preserved for future generations by excluding it from any dynamic. These are two examples of this uh, approach in the Netherlands. On top you see the, uh, the palace uh, at the Dam Square in uh, Amsterdam. Uh, and in the bottom you see Kinderdijk, uh, a World Heritage Site, which is about not only the mills, but the entire uh, water system there. And we carefully protect these sites. Um, for instance, recently uh, with Kinderdijk in the bottom, there was a, a proposal by the province to uh, place some new windmills there. And these would be so big that it would harm the, the, the side lines, the access of the site. So there was an heritage assessment, heritage impact assessment was done. And in the end, the plan was, uh, was abandoned. Um, and there's another plan now we're pending on, uh, on making a visitor center there. And, uh, Changing the the entrance uh, area of the area and uh, it's still at UNESCO now, so we're waiting for the for their um, take on it. 
So the, the second uh, paradigm you might, might say is heritage as a spatial factor. And this is what we see in the 90s where it becomes a, a part of a more economic debate, a, a, a source uh, for urban regeneration and um, reuse of, of, of heritage is much more common than adaptive reuse. Um, and uh, next to the intrinsic values, the economic values start to domina dominate. So these are two examples of that. Uh, on the top you see the West Gas Public Area. This is a, used to be a gas holder and it's now a park right in Amsterdam also. A uh, park used by people and used for events, but also of course for creative firms and other kind of firms you would expect uh, in such, a, such buildings. Um, and research has shown that this, this investment in this area, which was actually done by private initiative, um, has led to a, a, a rise in real estate uh, values of 20%. Not just regenerate uh, or gentrification purposes, but especially linked to this investment in cultural heritage. So, and on the bottom you see um, a bunker or a shelter, um, which was part of the uh, Dutch uh, water defense line, uh, which was used to flood uh, the area if the enemy would come, uh, which made no more sense after the airplane was introduced. So, as such, this, this water line is no more functioning and it uh, has many, many, it, it crosses all across the country and it has many of these shelters. So, in themselves, they are not, not that um, unique, so to say. And it was the reason for an architect to um, make the statement, uh, cutting it through, in order to not only make a design statement and a uh, line of sights, but also to um, involve visitors in what's actually inside, and it uh, attracts many, many uh, visitors each year. So the third and final um, approach is heritage as a spatial factor. Um, heritage is, is defined in time over and over again by society, so it's not a fixed stock, it's rather a dynamic uh, supply and it entails the physical aspects, but also the narratives, uh, the stories, the mentality, the, uh, the culture, uh, many of these uh, elements I've mentioned before, before this morning. Um, and it's also seen as a sort of inspiration for spatial developments, not only literally um, by adaptive reuse, but also much more um, uh, indirectly as, as people are involved and, and um, they relate to the, to the, to the, to the project because it, it provides the project with a context. So there are two examples here. Um, on the top you see um, um, the A, which is a sort of a river area in the Netherlands, which has been occupied very long, about 10, 000, oh, 10 million years already, and um, um, sorry, 10,000. And um, scientists have, <laughs> from many disciplines, have joined each other and joined the uh, local inhabitants to produce a, what's called a landscape biography, which reveals the geological developments that led to this particular area, but also anthropological uh, developments as well as uh, the many stories that are there amongst the people who live here now and it helps actually in um, overcoming a, a um, conflict that exists between the uh, ecologists who solve uh, very valuable uh, ecology there, uh, biodiversity and, and on the other hand the farmers who want to, to use it uh, and, and, and make a living there. Uh, the cult cultural landscape um, approach helps there in, in, in finding a common ground, actually. So I'll just quickly move on. Um, well, as we present these three approaches um, separately and also consecutively, it may appear that one has replaced the other, but rather we see this as a, as a layering that all three approaches still exist. Uh, segmentation may be a metaphor to describe it. Um, and not one approach is better than the other, it's just, it depends on what the actual situation is, which one to apply. And lastly, I would like to link this, also given the theme of the conference, with uh, uh, 
the model that has already been mentioned of uh, Heritage Counts for Europe uh, study, uh, which has been a meta study of, of about 150 studies on the impact of heritage, not only in economic terms, but also in social, environmental, and, and cultural terms. And I would like to argue, but this is not a fixed statement, it's the start of the debate. I would like to argue that, that the first um, approach is much more uh, in, the, in the cultural and the intrinsic uh, value uh, segment, while the second approach, the factor approach, of course, uh, relies on the economic value mostly, and the third approach factor um, is much more about co-creation and about sustainable development. And um, therefore, these these three approaches, we could argue, they are um, complementary. Uh, as I said before, it's up to, to the heritage professional to assess which one is best suitable for a mix, of course. So that's that. I managed. <laughs> so if you want to, uh, to uh, learn more about, uh, about this, this frame, you can use the QR code, um, or of course just the link for that link. And uh, if you have any questions or suggestions or improvements of this model, um, please shoot us an email. Leave it on the but Okay, thank you. That's so cool.